Welcome back, fellow SuiteScript developers. Today, I thought we'd have a little fun and see if we can learn SuiteScript using ChatGPT. Now, I am not a savvy AI prompting expert, so this is not a video about learning effective prompting tactics. I have done a little bit of research, but I am still very much an amateur. This video is more of an experiment. It is an assessment of the quality of SuiteScript information that we can get out of ChatGPT. I am recording this in April 2024 using ChatGPT 3.5, as that is the free version and thus most likely uh, most accessible for most viewers. Maybe if this video does well and y'all are curious, we will investigate more advanced models like GPT-4 or other LLMs that are more focused on writing code like GitHub's Copilot. So if you're interested in seeing that, hit the like button, comment down below to let me know. Okay, over to ChatGPT. All right, the first thing I wanted to do was establish some context with ChatGPT. So I set some context by explaining that it is a senior NetSuite developer, but I am not. I am trying to learn. I've never written code before. And then I asked it, can you teach me to write my very first suite script? And we got a whole bunch of instructions. So let's try to follow them. Right out the bat, it tells us suite script is JavaScript. That's great. That's a good start. And we're going to start with a simple example. Log into your NetSuite account. We've already done that on the left here. Customization, scripting, scripts, new. Okay, we are already off track. So what we can try to do is see if uh, ChatGPT can correct itself, can tell us uh, or get us unstuck rather. I told it that after clicking new, I only see uh, a prompt for a file. So let's see what it, if it can correct itself. So at this point, if you're brand new to coding and to you know, deploying scripts to NetSuite, I don't quite know how you would get yourself unstuck without cycling a bunch of times, going back and forth, trying to massage, manipulate, ask the very best possible question to get the right answer out of ChatGPT. So I'm gonna take the code that it wrote for us and turn that into a new file, upload it and select it here. I'll be back in a second. Okay, I've taken the contents of the script, this after submit user event here, made a new file called chatgpt.js and I'm about to upload that to the file cabinet and click create script record. Okay, let's see if we can pick up back our instructions. Give your script a name and a description. We're gonna call this chat GPT test. And if we skip down ahead, after writing your script, which we did in the file, click on save, click on deploy script, choose the appropriate deployment options based on your use case. Uh, and the next part doesn't make a lot of sense. You can choose run script type as user event. I'm not sure that's ever been a part of, of NetSuite. But let's put this on the employee record. Usually very, very few customizations around the employee record. So that will, should execute pretty quickly. We can leave it in testing mode. Again, if you're brand new to this, um, it's not going to explain any of this to you. We could probably ask it for more information about what is a script deployment? What is the status? What is the log level? Those sorts of things. Otherwise, I'm not sure how you would know what these are or what to set these fields to. So let's ask it about the status field here. Okay, this field helps you track whether the deployment is active, inactive, or pending. Interesting. If you're not familiar, our only options here are testing and released. Testing means it will only run for our user or rather the owner, uh, whoever's listed as the owner of the script. Released means it will run for whoever is in the audience here, uh, which is another thing it didn't have me set. We do, need, we do need to set an audience and the owner needs to be part of that audience in order for either testing or released mode to work. So I don't know where all this other information is coming from, not released, rejected, obsoleted, a little bit of maybe hallucination there. Um, so we just have testing and released options. How about the log levels? So 
Once again, I can already see that is way too much information. If we look here, we have four choices, debug, audit, error, emergency, but ChatGPT is telling us there are a bunch of additional levels that do not exist. Alert, critical, notice, information. So we can already see this is kind of shaping up to be a pretty difficult task if you're just trying to use this to learn. You're going to have to iterate a lot and try to figure out the right questions to ask. And when it gives you an answer, one of the biggest challenges, if you don't have any experience, is going to be assessing that answer. You need some prior knowledge in order to assess whether that is correct or helpful or useful. Um, so while it might give you a little bit of a starting point for each step of the way, you're going to do, be doing a lot of sort of figuring it out for yourself, stumbling through the different navigation paths or what fields to set. It's not always going to have the right answers for you. Okay, so I'm gonna set this up so that we can get sort of off the records and start looking at the code and see if it can explain the code to us. I deployed the script to the employee record. I'm gonna tell ChatGPT that uh, so that it has that context and then ask it how I'm supposed to test that. If we scroll up a little bit here, it says that to test the script, we perform the action that triggers it, such as creating or editing a record. Again, it's a starting point, but if you are not familiar with the after submit user event, it might be a little bit hard to glean from this step seven here, what you're actually supposed to do to get your script to trigger. And once you do get it to trigger, where should you look for information? So let's uh, give ChatGPT that information and see what happens next. Okay, so I've updated ChatGPT with the context and it gives me a little bit of information. My script is deployed to the employee record, so events might be record creation, editing, deletion, or other custom defined events. You cannot custom define events, but everything else seems accurate. Creating, editing, deleting will trigger our user event. The deployment status is set to released, indicating that the script deployment is active and available for use. The script will execute according to its deployment settings. It's all true, although very, very vague. With the log level set to debug, the execution logs generated when your script runs will include detailed debugging information. Okay, so it seems to at least understand from here where we are. So we need to know how to test this. So step one, trigger the script, perform an action on an employee record that triggers the script executions. This code including creating a new employee record, editing an existing one, or performing any other action. All right, so let's do that. Okay, I have my own employee record here. Let's just add a test note to it to trigger a save. And the instructions from ChatGPT aren't super explicit that we need to save the record. It's not something that happens as we're editing. I probably could ask some follow-up questions on what is a user event, what is the after submit event, things like that. And we'll do that in just a second. Uh, but for now, what does this tell us to do? We So we did step one, we triggered the script. Step two says monitor execution logs, access execution logs, customization. I don't think this is a real path. Scripting, scripted records. I'll open this up. I don't think there's an execution log uh, tab here, right? I do happen to know that it'll log to our script deployment record. And we do see that the script was deployed, did log these messages here. But the instructions for where to find those from ChatGPT are maybe unsurprisingly uh, incorrect. In the little testing I've done, it seems to have trouble with navigation paths, uh, locations of things on forms. And that's pretty understandable. Um, one, there's probably not a ton of NetSuite information that it was trained on. And two, that stuff changes fairly regularly, though not, you know, not super often. The rest is advice about sort of what we should do with these log messages. That's fine. Okay, so let's ask it for some follow-up information. Um, let's see if it can teach us what the user event script is. All right, 
So we've asked it, what is a user event? I mentioned that the script executes as expected at least. So hopefully it doesn't try to give us like troubleshooting information. Automate and customize the behavior of NetSuite records based on user interactions. True. Specifically designed to respond to actions performed by users. Mm, yes and no. They can also be triggered by scripts, imports, integrations, the uh, SCA front end, the web store, all kinds of stuff, not necessarily users editing records in NetSuite. They are triggered by record events. Specific events that occur on NetSuite records, yes. Uh, creation, editing, deletion, again, with the custom defined events, not really a thing that you can do. Context aware execution. When a user event is triggered, it executes with a specific context, yes. And that context provides the information being acted on. Yes, it does. That is the parameter that gets passed into our user event script. User event scripts have the ability to modify record data in response to the triggering event. Yes, they do. We can enforce business rules and validations, update related records. Yes, those are all great things to do with user events. Number four, the supported record types. Standard record types. Yes, they can. As well as custom record types. Yes, they can. Number four is all true. The execution lifecycle. Interesting. Or load before submit, after submit, or other custom defined phases. Again, no custom defined phases, but the other three are accurate. Each phase corresponds to a specific stage in the processing of the record. Yes, it does. Uh, so you can get the idea of a record's lifecycle from the user event entry points. Commonly used for a wide range of customizations. Data validation, definitely. Populating fields based on user input, yes. Uh, notifications are alert, absolutely. Complex business logic, sure, that's sort of generally what all scripts do. And integrating with external systems, definitely all good use cases for user event scripts. Let's see if we can learn a little bit more about after submit specifically. Okay, after submit occurs after a record has been successfully submitted to the system database. Yes, it does. Anything you do in before submit happens before after submit. Accurate. Access to final record data. During the after submit event, you have access to the final state of the record. Yes, you do. Used for post-processing logic. Yes. Sending notifications, updating related records, triggering workflows. Uh, yes, all of that. All of those are really good use cases for specifically the after submit event. So there is good information here. Number four there, the complete record lifecycle. That's information we already saw that it's repeating. There is good information in here, but it's not all good. And that is one of the problems when you're trying to use this tool to learn. It's going to be really hard to suss out what is accurate and what is not. So when you're doing this, if this is uh, an approach you decide to take to learn, I definitely recommend one testing as you go to verify, basically verify everything it says, and wherever possible, bring up the corresponding area of NetSuite help or other documentation to help sort of corroborate or reject what ChatGPT is telling you. So now let's have it actually, I said this earlier, but now let's actually get into the code. Let's have ChatGPT explain it to us line by line. All right, I, it looks like it really is going line by line. That's great. The formatting is a little tough to read here. I think the first thing I wanna look at is, is this actually the same script? So we have a defined statement, we have the after submit function, we have a guard on the context type and a log statement and the module output. Is that the same as before? Define after submit guard log statement output. Looks pretty much the same. Number one is explaining the header, the documentation header, which is which tells us what version the script is and what type of script it is. These are script annotations that specify the API version and the type of script. Yes, they do. It is not a SuiteScript 2.0 user event. This says 2.x and that will change. It might be 2.0 or it might be 2.1 depending on the settings in the account where the script is running. So in general, I would never use 2.x. You always wanna be very specific about which version you're running. 
uh, especially if you are making a suite app and distributing this code to multiple accounts that might have very different settings and configurations. So avoid 2.x for sure. And this is a little bit misleading to tell you that it is specifically a suite script 2.0 script. That's not quite true. Not quite false either. Again, that adds to the challenge. All right, next, define uh, the define statement. This line defines the module dependencies for the script. It does. It imports the n slash log module, which provides functions for logging messages. Yep, all true. Uh, define function is part of the require JS module loading system used in SuiteScript 2.0. All correct. That's all accurate. You don't have to import the log module. The log module is always imported. It doesn't hurt anything to explicitly import it like this though. I have no issues with it doing that. Next, we have our function definition of the after submit. The main function of the script, it takes a context parameter, which provides information about the execution context of the script. That's a little bit like using the word to define the word, but it is accurate. And we can use a follow-up question to explore the structure of that context object, maybe. The guard, this line checks if the event type is create or edit. And if either of those is true, then what's inside proceeds. I might write that a little differently in my own code, but that's kind of neither here nor there. That is true. This is how you guard against uh, different events and make sure your code only runs for the specific events that you want it to. Then we have our log.audit call. Audit messages are typically used for tracking important events in the system. That's true. That's how I use them. I use audit mostly to tell me where in the code I get to, did I reach this certain point? And then I use debug to tell me more specific information. What's the value of this variable or that array or, or whatever it might be. Title uh, specifies the title of the audit message. Yes, it does. Details specifies the details of the audit message. Again, we're using the words to define the words. I'm not sure how helpful that is if you're brand new, but we have a little clarification, includes a descriptive message. Yeah. So not too bad. And then we get into the, the closing statements here. Yeah, the return statement here, number 10, is important. This line exports the after submit function, making it accessible to NetSuite scripting engine. It essentially defines the entry point of the script. It does. That's correct. It's very important to know. That's maybe a little too vague if you are brand new. But again, we could dig in with follow-up questions maybe and get a more detailed explanation. Okay, so we import the log message, log module in this function. So I wanna have ChatGPT explain to me what else, what is the log module? What does it do? See how it does with that. Provides functions for logging various types of messages. Yes, it does. Quickly scanning the numbered headings here. Not sure where warning come from, came from, but the rest are accurate. You can call it this way. I wouldn't. That will put, it's a little bit misleading, that will put the message in the title of the execution log rather than in the details, which is maybe not what you want. But you can call it either with strings directly or with a single object and title and details. When you call it with strings, you can call it with two separate strings, one being the title, the second being the message or the details rather. I prefer to be more explicit and call it this way with the actual parameter names there. So not too much variation in these. Again, warning does not exist. So we do have to be careful of that. Um, so this is close. Once again, a good starting point, but you might be floundering around a little bit if you're say trying to use the warning method, method that does not exist. Now what I'm not doing because a new user wouldn't do this, I'm not trying to correct it. I'm not trying to tell it like, hey, this is not how you pass strings to these messages because if you're brand new, you don't know that. You wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, so I'm trying not to retrain it or give it more context or better information or anything like that. Uh, what are some other things we might ask of it? Maybe what are the differences between SuiteScript 2.0 and SuiteScript 2.1? Let's 
let's see if it can compare and contrast the two versions. All right, quite a lot here. 2.0 introduced in 2015 based on ES5, that's correct. Modular code organization using AMD, that is correct as well. Promises for async operation, there are promises in 2.0, that's true. The core logic is broken out into separate modules provided by NetSuite, also true. If number six is true, I'm not aware of it. So if I have a user event that is using the record module and the HTTPS module, both of those usages will count towards the user events limit. They will not be separated into their own limit. A user event does not get 1000 units per module that it imports. It just gets a thousand limit, a thousand units. I'm pretty sure number six is very wrong and that could get you in a lot of trouble uh, or be very confusing. So again, there like five out of six, five were super accurate and correct. And number six is wildly incorrect and might get you in trouble. So we do have to be very careful using this when we are learning. We cannot, we have to take everything it tells us with a grain of salt. SweetScript 2.1 introduced in 2019. Yes, it was. It is ES6 and it's actually even later than that. It's ES Next, ES 2019, I think, at the time I'm recording this, maybe even uh, newer now. Improved error handling capabilities, I suppose. You could always use try catch blocks. Yeah, <laughs> try catch blocks were absolutely available in SweetScript 2.0 and 1.0. So I'm not sure where the improved error handling comes in additional methods and functionality. It actually doesn't expand the SweetScript API. The SweetScript API between 2.0 and 2.1 is the same. The modules are the same. The functions and properties are all the same. What it does is upgrade, update the JavaScript engine that is running SweetScript to the more modern ES 2019 and beyond standard rather than ES5 like 2.0 and 1.0 are. Scripts written in 2.1 may not be compatible with 2.0 due to the use of ES6 syntax and additional features. Absolutely true. 2.1 is backward compatible with 2.0, meaning that scripts written in 2.0 can be executed in 2.1 without modification. That's true, though you might get some complaints from um, IDEs or maybe from the browser, uh, like warnings. But in general, yeah, your 2.0 code will work for the most part as a 2.1 script, but not the other way around. If you use more modern syntax, arrow functions, constants, uh, let locally scoped variables, things like that will not work or there will be functions that do not exist because of the difference in the JavaScript engine. Improved performance. SweetScript 2.1 may offer improved performance. Uh, and I know that's heavily emphasized, say, in the NetSuite docs as well. SweetScript 2.0 might be faster than 1.0 and 2.1 might be faster than 2.0 sometimes. So that's something you'd have to test, observe for yourself. If you were really curious, the performance gains are probably very minimal and not noticeable to users for most use cases. All right, what's something we else we could introduce to this? Let's have it let's have it change the script to from 2.0 to 2.1. All right, here are the key changes made. I can see already the arrow function up here. What I don't like is that it did not specify uh 2.1 here, but I already went through that. Uh so we added arrow functions. Good. We, we did for, for here, but not for the after submit function. That's fine. Destructuring, I see, yeah, we destructure the context variable here. Uh, template literals, do we use templ template literals? We do right here to avoid string concatenation. Great, looks, looks accurate. And when the variable matches the property name, we don't need to repeat them here. So good, those are all accurate changes. Now, one thing I wanted it to do is have it explain to me this context parameter. I want to know what's what's in that object. So let's see if it can break down that structure for us. And I will follow my own advice here. 
and bring up the structure of the context object for after submit in NetSuite help. So first here we can see the different values for the user event type. We have create, edit, x edit, delete, like ChatGPT mentions here, but we have a whole bunch of other types it might be as well during after submit and things like copy and view are not among them. If you are viewing a record, it is not being submitted, so it will, would never trigger after submit. Scrolling down a little further, the only object or pr properties we have on this object during after submit are new record, old record, and type. That is it. So everything else down below here in ChatGPT is not there. Again, a little bit misleading. Um, another thing we might do if we wanted to explore that further is actually log out the actual context object from our script to investigate it further and see what's actually in there at runtime rather than just reading about it in either of these places. User and company information generally does not come through on the context object. That is something you get from the runtime module and maybe the configuration module as well. So again, big chunk of the information is right, but enough of it is wrong that you have to be really careful and test and confirm all of this before you threw this into production, expecting it to work. But in terms of the code that it gave us, the actual code worked. We didn't have to modify the code at all. And it, implemented some things we didn't even tell it to, like choosing specific event types, just gave us a working example to learn from. So from that perspective, it did really well, at least with the code. Everything around that, explaining the code, uh, navigating the UI, things like that, I think you would have a really hard time getting the right instructions if you were brand new. I do think it's a useful tool. I think it can give you a lot of ideas and get you started in the right direction, but you're still gonna have to do a lot of heavy lifting yourself, verifying the code that it wrote, making sure you understand the steps, where to go in the UI, why you're going there, what the different fields are, things like that it seems to struggle on quite a bit, but writing the actual code, it did pretty well. All in all, I think you should definitely give it a try if for nothing else than to get used to using ChatGPT and tools like it to assist you in your job, even if that job doesn't become NetSuite development or writing code, getting comfortable with tools like this is going to be an essential part of any job. This sort of tool technology is not going anywhere. It will only get bigger, more prevalent. And while I have no concerns that ChatGPT 3.5 is going to take my job as a developer, I definitely think that other developers using tools like ChatGPT, those developers will take my jobs. It is becoming an essential skill in the modern workplace. No matter what industry in, no matter what role you're in, you're going to want to be accustomed to using tools like this to make yourself more effective, more efficient, but you need to be proficient with analyzing their output and not just trusting them implicitly. Get started practicing now. There's no reason it can't help you learn and get your foot in the door. Just take everything it tells you with a grain of salt, like you should any other material you find on the internet. That's it for this one. Keep learning, keep sharing, and I'll see you next time.